Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Library Company of Philadelphia, and thank you for joining us for tonight's program and book talk, The Cacophony of Politics, Northern Democrats in the Civil War with Professor Matt Gallman. My name is Fran Dolan. I'm the Director of Operations for the Library, and we are very excited to have Professor Gallman join us this evening. And we are very excited to have all of you joining us as well. If it's your first time at a Library Company event, welcome. If you've attended previous events before, welcome back. The Library Company, founded in 1731, is an independent research library with collections that primarily focus on American culture and society from the 17th through 19th centuries. We are free and open to the public. Please check out our website, librarycompany.org, for our schedule of upcoming events and to learn more about the library and consider becoming a shareholder in the Library Company, which makes an enormous impact on our institution and allows us to present programs like this free of charge. The Fireside Chat series began in 2020 during the initial COVID quarantine as a way to keep the scholarly community of the library active while the doors to the institution were closed. It continues today as a way to highlight the work of library company fellows and to put a spotlight on all the exciting research that is emerging from our collections today. Fireside Chats occur on the third Thursday of every month Following tonight's talk, there will be a Q&A session. You can submit your questions through the Q&A function in your Zoom. Tonight's session is also being recorded and will be distributed to all attendees. It's also will live on our YouTube channel where you can find all of our previous programs. Closed captioning is available for tonight's event. If you wish to turn it off, following the instructions that are posted in the chat. And finally, I'd like to thank Blanche Brown for being the wizard behind the curtain tonight and making sure that everything runs smoothly. If you have any questions, She's available throughout the program for any kind of tech assistance. Matt Goldman received his BA from Princeton University and his PhD from Brandeis University. He has been a member of the history department at the University of Florida since 2003. Prior to that, he taught at Loyola College in Maryland, Gettysburg College, and Occidental College. An author or editor of 10 books, Goldman is a historian of 19th century America with a frequent focus on the Civil War home front. His courses generally concern 19th century American history, American women's history, the history of poverty and welfare, and the Civil War era. His most recent publications are Defining Duty in the Civil War, Personal Choice, Popular Culture, and the Union Homefront, and as co-editor with Gary Gallagher, The Lens of War, Historians Reflect on Their Favorite Civil War Photographs. His most recent book, the Cacophony of Politics, Northern Democrats, and the American Civil War is a subject of his fireside chat this evening. Welcome, Professor Gallman. Thank you very much. It's uh, great to be here um, in this kind of COVID world where I, you can see me, I can not see you, and I don't have to wear socks. So on balance, I think it's a plus. Uh, my goal today is really to say a bit of background about this book, which is really a book about civil war politics, um, and then get into some kind of case studies that I think illuminate at least what I believe I'm getting at. But I wanted to begin by just saying that I, well, I'm thrilled to be um, joining this Fireside Chat series. I have a very, very long history with the library company and historical society next door. Um, I did my dissertation at Brandeis back before, well, really, as computer, computers were first coming into vogue, um, on Philadelphia home front during the Civil War. It was really a, a social history and an economic history of the city during the war. And um, in my, my goal is I was really a social historian by training and by inclination. And so I, I steered pretty clear of politics. And I steered clear of famous people and tried to really do, so, you know, write a history from the, the ground up, but using Philadelphia as the centerpiece for that book. Um, while coming to, um, to Philadelphia and also by coming downtown to the library company, I usually stayed with the family of a friend of mine, um, Dalla Hempel. If we go to the next slide, if we could. Um, for, um, I can decide after that. There's my book. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, my friend Dallet was actually a college friend and a graduate student friend and one of my best friends. And she 
taught other scientists for her whole career. And she passed away about five years ago. And when she passed away, she left behind the manuscript of this wonderful book that I just received, which is really case studies of Philadelphians in early America. She wrote them and they were, the book is edited by Dan Richter, who folks in the library company certainly know, and Rod um, Hessinger. And I just want to mention it because my contacts with Philadelphia and the library company really go back to um, staying at Dallas Foundling's house um, up in Germantown. And so there is that. So we can go on to the next slide. Um, actually, you want, uh, the, let me just say a little bit about what I was trying to accomplish with this book. It, my career has been on much as been frequently focused on the Civil War home front, not always, but frequently. But usually I see myself as a social historian and I've written about women, I've written about immigrants, I've written about race. And I was really kind of coming, I'd finished this previous book and a friend of mine said, maybe I should consider writing something about politics. And so I spent considerable time reading about Democrats during the Civil War. And so I don't really know who's in the audience now. I don't know who really knows anything about Democrats during the Civil War. I hope you don't know too much. But what I discovered is that the scholarship on Democrats during the war is not thick. The shelf is not full of books. I mean, there are some important books, but they're not tons. And I concluded that there was room to write a book about the Democrats. Again, the Democrats are the people who opposed Abraham Lincoln, who was a Republican. They divided over the war. Some of them were really violently opposed to the war, sometimes quite violently. Others were, you know, they supported the war, even though they didn't support Lincoln. And I decided that there's a book to be written here about the politics of the war that really had not yet been written. And so I ended up with this book, which is, I would describe it as one major part, sort of a, an interpretive synthesis of politics and Democrats during the war based on you know, reading a lot of scholarship and so on. And I was trying to write a book that would be open to people who did not know much about the topic, certainly. And then the other aspect of it is really a book that is based on original research and case studies and my own interpretation of how politics really worked. And that leads me to <clears throat> sort of talk about the major issues of the war, but also to really talk about political culture. And I try to write a book that is really about, so almost like a social history of politics and political culture. And I end up now with a book that is, that sets the stage with the coming of the war and so on, but then kind of moves into a series of topics. And my introduction kind of really violates certain norms in that what I've done is I've actually suggested six themes of the book, which I'm not really gonna go through for you now. And I've tried to argue that in fact, politics does not have a single topic or a single theme, but multiple themes. And including the significance of women in politics, the significance of the working class in politics, uh, but also the wild differences during the Civil War between you know, Kentucky versus New York and geography. Um, and is the, the overwhelming significance of, of race and racism in shaping lots of the politics of the war. All these threads kind of run through this book. And in addition to kind of telling the narrative, I found myself with probably 60 or 70 case studies of different lengths. And I picked out a handful of them for today. And so that starts me off in April 61, and again, you may not be experts, but this is the, the month of Fort Sumter. And as the war begins, or well, let me back up a second. In the months between Abraham Lincoln's election, which is November 1860, and April 61, Philadelphia is a city that is not anxious to go to war. It's a city with great Southern ties, lots of Southerners in the city. And we see lots of public activism that is really public politics in meetings and, and calls for compromise and so on. But then South Carolina fires on Fort Sumter in April and suddenly the North and Philadelphia in particular, the switch is turned and people you know, rally around patriotism. And 
that becomes kind of interesting story where I think part of the story is that if you are opposed to the union war effort, what you do is you quickly figure out that you probably should keep your mouth shut. And so, and so it looks like the North is more unanimous than it probably really is, but it's still pretty unanimous. Now, if we go to the next slide. Thank you there. There we go. Um, this is just a working thing. I, I didn't put this in the book, but this is right out of Google Maps. When I was most recently, I was, I was a fellow with the library company a couple of years ago, and I, I, I lived up in Old Town, and I used to walk to um, the library company in different, different routes, and I quickly discovered that the Democrats in Philadelphia, both pro-war and anti-war, and their newspapers were really deeply clustered. So a lot of them had legal offices as and sort of near Washington Square. And then the newspapers were sort of usually just a bit north of that, were sort of clustered around Independent Hall and all that. And so really you could stand in the in at Independent Hall and throw a softball and hit, you know, well, actually that's not true, but close to, you could hit Democrats of, of different stripes who are really clustered socially, culturally, politically, economically. Once the shooting starts, we have lots of episodes of pro-war rioters hitting the streets and attacking Democrats. You see the Palmetto flag up there. That was a South Carolina, that was a newspaper that was sort of used the South Carolina flag as a symbol and a crowd attacked the Palmetto flag. Um, if you go down Chestnut Street, a few, a few blocks from there, um, the American Hotel actually went to fly a flag because everyone's flying flags to show they're patriotic. They flew their flag, but they got so upset they flew it upside down. And the crowd saw that as a symbol of anti-patriotism. And so the crowd attacked that. And so what we see is this great burst of street activity, which is very much politics. It's the politics of civil disobedience. It's the politics of in the street politics. It's not a moment of great violence, meaning people are not getting killed, except in Baltimore, but that's another story. Um, but it is a moment when people who are in favor of this war are in the streets speaking politically, I think. So put a, you know, put a pin in that, so to speak. And that's sort of April, 1861. Now, fairly early in the war, really by the, by the end of the, uh, 1862, both the North and the South have turned to conscription. And conscription, the draft, is a moment that triggers political dissent of a more, a more sort of serious sort. Now let's go to the next slide. Oh, I took about actually no, well, that's okay, you can leave that. I forgot, there's not really a slide here, but I don't have any images. But in no, November 1862, which I spent about a couple of several pages on, in a place called Port Washington, Wisconsin, you have this fascinating moment where the folks in Port Washington riot. They riot because Wisconsin has started the first state militia draft. And which is going on all over the North and in, in Port Washington, it's pretty interesting to me because it's a fairly small town. It's, I say, it's right on, on the lake um, and right, right near Milwaukee. Um, and what we find is that, that the city is, is about half immigrants who are either Germans or from Luxembourg. And the immigrant population is deeply opposed to this draft. And in response to the draft, they hit the streets once again, more public activism in the streets, and they get drunk, they throw stuff, and something like 15,000 people get arrested. And it's, it's kind of a bigger deal. It's a much bigger deal than the response to 1861. Um, the press covers it. It becomes a big deal. One of my favorite quotes, which gets in one of my big themes, one of the papers describes it, of the, 100, of the 131 people arrested, I said, um, that they were several, quote, bitter and vindictive women um, were, were sort of demonstrating their political dis distrust of the North. And I'm not gonna say anything more about the draft here, but in my book, I, I talk about lots of moments when Northerners are upset about the draft, most famously in New York in July of 63 in the New York City draft riot. And when they're upset about the draft, they hit the streets and there's political activism in the streets leading to violence and in New York leading to deaths, but in Milwaukee leading to arrests and people breaking things and so on, which sort of eliminates a bunch of my themes. Now, since I didn't do a slide for Port Washington, this guy 
is not well known, but I find him fascinating. This is Francis Sherman. Sherman was a brickmaker. He was mayor of Chicago in the 1840s. And then he'd been mayor again at the beginning part of the war, but Chicago has very short mayoral terms. And so now in it, he is in 1862 into 63, he's running for reelection. Sherman is a Democrat. He's opposed to Lincoln. He's opposed to some of the things the Republicans are doing. And Chicago, then as it is now, was deeply politically divided, almost right up the middle. And so Sherman is a politician who wishes to re win re-election, which means he has to appeal to Republicans, he has to appeal to Democrats. And the Democratic paper in the town, the Chicago, the Chicago Times, supports Sherman. But the Republican paper, the Tribune, hates Sherman. And they devote lots and lots of ink to describing what a horrible person Sherman was. And what is interesting to me is the Tribune calls, calls Sherman a copperhead. Now, you probably know the term copperhead. The copperheads were thought of as, I mean, they were opposed to war, but they were thought of as treasonous and opposed to the United States. And they were portrayed in the, you know, the most vile terms as a rule. And this is what the Tribune is saying about Sherman. And Sherman is basically saying, I'm a Democrat. I'm not a copperhead. I'm, not, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a patriot. I'm just opposed to the Lincoln administration. I'm allowed to be that. And so this becomes this really interesting election where Sherman's son, who's a military a colonel, also named Francis, and Colonel, colonel Francis Sherman writes a public letter we criticize, they're both Democrats, but he criticizes those Democrats who are insufficiently pro-war. And so now Sherman's, Sherman the Elder is being embarrassed by Sherman the Younger, and the Tribune reprints Sherman the Younger's letter, which gets at other interesting wartime themes. But Sherman goes on to win. He wins in a very, very close election, and the Tribune, not unlike today, claims that the whole thing was fraud, and that he was is a crooked election, so on, which pretty clearly is untrue. Um, but Sherman and goes on to give his inaugural address as the victor, as the mayor. And I spent some time reading over this address, which is not that long; it's actually online. That um, effectively, if you read this address, Francis Sherman, the mayor, sounds like an, a, a, an urban mayor of a pretty big city. He talks about you know issues like water and so on, and policing and so on. And then he adds a paragraph where he addresses this, the kind of elephant in the room. And that is, he says, look, I am not treasonous. He says, I may even have a good quote here in front of me. He says that we Democrats are faithful in our duty to our government, but they're also faithful to themselves and their fellow citizens. And they're perfectly willing to point out when they feel that the executive has been guilty of illegal and wanton oppression. Sherman is setting himself up as, as a patriot who, as a Democrat, is allowed to criticize the administration. But the Tribune is saying he's treasonous because he's you know, critical. And to the extent that Sherman finds his way into history books, which isn't really all that much, but some, he is kind of painted as a, a copperhead, even though it's pretty clear that Sherman was not a copperhead, but rather a politician who was a conservative Democrat, which I think is kind of interesting. There are others of the, of, of, of the period who were pretty wildly anti-war and quasi-treasonous, but not, not really, not, not most, not, not most at all. Okay, let's switch to this next, next slide. All right. In my book, I spent a fair amount of time talking about one particular evening in Philadelphia. The guy on the left in front of you, I hope you, you may recognize him, that's George McClellan. The guy on the right is a guy by the name of George Woodward. McClellan, you probably know, was, had been a general, in this picture, the general. He is a Pennsylvanian, he's a Democrat, and he had been fired the previous year after Antietam by Abraham Lincoln. And so he basically went to live in New Jersey and then, and then in New York. And Democrats saw him as a great hero, even though he'd been a fired hero. 
Woodward on the right was a judge. He was a conservative Democrat. He was a sitting judge who had some opinions out there that were questioning whether the draft was constitutional, for instance. Um, but mostly, he is someone who doesn't talk politics at all. And he doesn't talk politics, because, particularly because he's a sitting judge. But now he's running for governor of Pennsylvania against Curtin. But as a guy running for governor of Pennsylvania, who's also a judge, he refuses to campaign because he thinks it's inappropriate. So he turns to a guy named Charles Biddle. That's Biddle in the middle there. Um, although the picture's way too young. Biddle is a lawyer and from Philadelphia who'd fought in the Mexican War. He'd served one term in Congress. And his papers, which are quite extensive, are in historical society. I spent lots of time reading them. Woodward goes to Biddle and says, I want you to manage my campaign. Biddle concludes wisely that if we can just get George McClellan to endorse Woodward, That'll help a lot. So he writes to McClellan and says, you don't know me, but wouldn't it be swell if you endorsed John Woodward? And in his letter, he basically tells McClellan that the Republicans are claiming that Woodward, I'm sorry, that McClellan has endorsed Curtin, which was not really true, but you know, it's politics. And so when McClellan comes to the city in September 1863, he writes a note to, to um, Biddle and says, come see me at my hotel. And that's what Biddle does. He goes to the hotel and that night, it's a nighttime meeting, he sends a long letter to Woodward, which is in his files, where he basically describes to Woodward what he learned about George McClellan. And one thing he learned was McClellan and Woodward really are kind of similar in their political beliefs. But he also writes, and here I am gonna quote, that McClellan is not so conversant as you may suppose with our state politics or the opinions of individuals. A frank and friendly converse exposition of matters from yourself will no doubt give him much information on those subjects. Here's what's going on. Biddle thinks McClellan is a conservative Democrat who knows nothing about politics. Near does Woodward really. Biddle knows a bit about politics. And Biddle thinks McClellan doesn't realize that Woodward is being um, portrayed in the press as a copperhead. So Biddle arranges a meeting between McClellan and Woodward, a breakfast meeting, where they decide they like each other. And McClellan, again, has no idea that the newspapers in the city and in the state and really a bit in the country are just already describing Woodward as treasonous, which wasn't fair or true, but it was in the press. And so it had some element of truth in the public mind. And so Biddle then writes to McClellan and essentially ghost writes a public letter. Let's go to the next slide. We flip to the next slide. And the end of this letter is, is, from, is, is published in the press, published in, in, in flyers all over the city. I desire to state clearly and distinctly that having some few days ago had a full conversation with Judge Woodward, I find that our views agree. And I regard his election as governor of Pennsylvania. And, and, and I, I call, that's a bad quote there. And I, I call for, um, I, I regard him as, as, as a good candidate for governor. And I think folks should vote for him, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so that becomes the public statement. So the newspapers all over the country basically write, McClellan endorses Copperhead. And McClellan endorses the treasonous Woodward. And if you look at private conversation a year and a half later, there's still Northerners saying that when they're trying to decide whether they should vote for McClellan as president, they're saying, well, the problem is he endorsed Woodward. And I find it to be a fascinating story because I think that basically Biddle kind of you know, played McClellan like a cheap violin, that McClellan had no idea who, what he was doing, who he was dealing with, and he wrote this public letter the problem was it came too late and curtain beats we were pretty handily and but McClellan is tainted politically by that okay let's shift gears here and let's move to brooklyn new york in another slide some folks may know i have no idea who's actually here but years ago i wrote a biography of anna dickerson anna dickerson was a was a republican public speaker during the civil war even though 
of course, he, he would never be able to vote. Women weren't going to vote to, you know, she was legally able to vote at the end of her life, but she never does vote. But she's famous. She's a celebrity. In fact, she lived on Locust Street, right down the street from the library company. Um, well, the Republicans, or so Democrats, recognize that those crazy Republicans have figured something out, that even though men can't vote, Anna Dickinson sways public opinion. So several of the leading Democrats, including, um, well, anyway, said, um, go to a woman named Emma Webb. Emma Webb was an actress with a Southern background. She and her sister were an acting team. They were kind of famous. They're fairly famous. And they basically get Emma Webb to be like Anna Dickinson and to go on the, the speaking circuit describing how the United, uh, American voters should support the Democratic Party. And sure enough, Webb goes to Brooklyn, gives a, a, a highly publicized, pretty widely reviewed public speech where she endorses the Democratic Party and, and, and she basically is opposed to the war. She's, she's really the real copperhead. But then she endorses McClellan, who's not really a real copperhead. And she then goes on to give about a dozen more lectures around the North and Northeast and the, and the Midwest before she returns to the stage. Um, and he becomes, in my, in my view, a good illustration of this other thing. And um, actually, you're, 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 you're flipping past me here. Okay, but let's hold on to Emma Webb for a second. Um, I want to I want to change to uh, there's not a slide for this, but Anna LaRoche. Anna LaRoche was a a Philadelphian. Although I first encountered Anna LaRoche at Columbia University because she married a New Yorker, and so her diaries are in Columbia. So I'm the only person alive who went to Columbia University in search of ever evidence on Philadelphia home front. Anna LaRoche was a as that was her father was a pretty well known Democrat, and she was a, a a fairly young woman who goes to who who is attending political rallies. A good example of a woman in public going to rallies, and her diary is full of politics and so on. And then in May sixty four, a couple of months later, I have no picture of Anna LaRoche. Um, she goes to New York to visit a friend, and in her diary she writes, "I met Dr. Mott." He looked very bright and handsome with his bright blue eyes and pretty mouth. But I have taken a great dislike to him of his politics and I will not be won over. So she meets Dr. Mott, Francis Mott, and finds him charming. He has a great mouth and I just don't have a slide for this. And, but she doesn't like him because of his politics. The next day she's invited to a dinner and she's seated beside Dr. Mott, who's a New Yorker. And she again writes in her diary, so I had to talk with him, she reports in her diary after sitting beside him. I like him ever so much and do so not wish to I like him as he is a Republican. And sure enough, the fact that that November, she, they get engaged, they get married right after the war. And so we have this classic case of a Democrat marrying a Republican and their, their battle, their relationship it's pretty heatedly at odds over politics. And my book actually has about, I don't know, seven or eight other relationships between men and women, either married or a, a fiancés, who either share the same politics or who are very different in their politics. But my larger point is that there's just lots and lots of evidence of Civil War women um, articulating pretty you know, sort of profound political beliefs. Um, all right, let's go on to. Lincoln's blind memo. I'm doing okay. And it'll be the next slide. This again is just one moment in one day in August 23rd, 1864. Abraham Lincoln is a very politically savvy guy. He's got political advisors all over the country who know things and are advising him. And he's up for re-election and on August 23rd, he walks into the to, to a meeting with his cabinet and he hands out, he brings in this memo and we can flip to the next slide. Which you can't read, but I can read it to you. It's a, it's a little sheet of paper, it's much, it's much shorter, smaller than that in fact. Well, I should smaller than what it looks like. He writes, this morning, as for some days past, 
it seems exceedingly probable that this administration will not be reelected. Then it will be my duty to so co cooperate with the president elect, and we don't know who that is yet, as to save the union between the election and the inauguration. Because once the new guy is elected, inaugurated, there'll be little chance to save the union. He will have secured his election on such ground that he could not possibly save it afterwards. He takes his sheet of paper and he folds it over before he walks into the cabinet room and he seals it. Now we go to the next slide. Go to the next slide here. He has all of the cabinet members who are present sign this. Now we can have interesting arguments about what the hell does that mean? They're mostly lawyers. And basically he's asking them to sign a document promising to support the new president once Lincoln loses none of which has any is legally binding at all. But I do think that it tells me a couple interesting things. Most important, it, it really tells me that Abraham Lincoln is thinking about this upcoming election, which, which is just going to be a few months off, 10 weeks off. Um, and he honestly believes he's going to lose. I think he honestly believes he's going to lose, or at least it's likely. And that belief tells us something that's worth contemplating. Uh, because I think that the election of '64, and I spent two chapters on this election, is very much conditional on events, um, events on the battlefield, events at home, especially on the battlefield, and the timing of the election really matters. In fact, when Lincoln wins the election, we think of it as, okay, we Lincoln won, but George McClellan, who ran against him, got 45% of the vote. And had it been eight weeks earlier, before Atlanta fell, for instance, it seems entirely possible that McClellan would have won and Lincoln would have lost. And I think the blind memo is really good evidence of that simple fact. So I don't want to give anything away here, but Lincoln won that election. And in April, mid-April, series of things happened and series of weekends. Um, Richmond falls. Robert E. Lee surrenders his army to Ulysses as his grant. And then on April 14th, Abraham, or 18th, 13th, or April 14th, Abraham Lincoln is shot at Ford's Theater. You know this. Um, and dies the next day. Immediately after Lincoln's assassination, we see something that is kind of akin to what happened after Fort Sumter. That's to say, Crowds hit the streets and they're angry and people who are perceived as pro-Confederates or pro-Southerners pretty quickly recognize that they better shut up. Um, Maria Daly, who's one of my kind of favorite New York diarists, you know, describes hanging black crepe on her windows so that the crowd doesn't destroy her house, um, even though, you know, she's no fan of Lincoln. She feels bad he got assassinated, but so on. But I want to sort of shift to, and we'll get to the next slide, a Philadelphian. And the Philadelphian is a guy named Edward Ingersoll. Edward Ingersoll and his brother, Charles Ingersoll, they were copperheads. They were anti-war. They were anti-abolitionists. They were anti-Lincoln. They were rich. They were annoying as all hell. They were, um, and they, they would write pamphlets that they would, they would sort of published on their own. They were not significant people. They were not office holders or anything like that, but they were sort of well known for their political beliefs. So on April 13th, and perhaps that day matters, on April 13th, Edward Ingersoll went and took a train to New York City where he gave a lecture to an organization with a great name. It's the, an organization called the Anti-Abolition States Rights Society. And he gives this lecture, it's like an after, it's an after talk. There's a dinner of these anti-abolitionist people. There's a talk, Ingersoll is the, you know, the visiting um, celebrity of sorts. He says to them, I yield to no man in sympathy to the people of the South. And he, I, he embraced the doctrine of secession as an American doctrine. Now under normal circumstances, this event would have gotten no coverage at all. No one would have cared. It just sounds like another crazy um, um, copperhead. But poor Edward Ingersoll gave this lecture in New York, and two days later, 
Abraham Lincoln dies. Philadelphia's Evening Bulletin, this is a New York event, but Philadelphia runs a column which they call the Ingersoll and Booth Doctrine, where they basically complain. They compare Ingersoll to John Wilkes Booth and pretty much imply that Ingersoll has something to do with this kind of assassination, even though his speech came two days before Lincoln died. And so we have lots of this kind of talk that people are angry at Edward Ingersoll, even though, again, Edward Ingersoll just gave this drunken talk. I'm, I feel quite confident he was drunk at the time. And on April 27th, so two weeks later, he takes a train back to town. And, and the, the press has said, you know, Ingersoll is coming back to town. And he shows up at the train station in Philadelphia where a guy named um, Captain Withington of the 198th Pennsylvania Volunteers is with a mob of angry people and accosts Ingersoll and demands that he apo apo apologize. Ingersoll's response, according to newspapers, was go to hell. At this point, and as I, in my book I write, as at this point, because history is just more entertaining than fiction, Willington and Ingersoll square off with their canes and they proceed to duel with their canes until finally Ingersoll and his whole crowd around him. So he's on, he's on his own, surrounded by a crowd with a, a union captain and the cane, his cane breaks. And so Ingersoll reaches into his pocket and pulls out a pistol, at which point the crowd kind of backs off and things get so interesting because it looks like the crowd might just overwhelm him, but there were police standing by kind of watching the whole thing, basically waiting to see if Ingersoll would get beat up. Um, but once he pulled the pistol, they arrest him because, and you might find this interesting, it was against the law to carry a concealed weapon in Philadelphia in 1865. Um, so he gets carried off to jail and his brother Charles shows up and a crowd beats his brother up. And afterwards he's, he's given bail and he leaves town and you know he gets away more or less safely. It's an interesting little story and it's kind of funny in various ways. But I think what's really interesting about it is that this is yet another example of public speech and political speech and political speech in the form of, of mob rule in a sense where Edward Ingersoll was a complete jerk, but he's being attacked because he refuses to apologize for what he said in New York, even though he said it two days before Lincoln was shot. And he just refuses to go along with the mob. But since he's rich, he, take, he, he leaves town, goes somewhere else, and apparently lives happily ever after. Um, I have, I think, used up the allotted time, but I am happy to answer questions and there's ample time for that. Well, thank you so much, Professor Gallman. It was very interesting. We do have a couple questions um, that are coming in. And if any of you do have questions you submit for the Q&A, you can use the Q&A function um, on the bottom bar there and submit them that way. So the first one we have um, comes from Ira Fischler. Um, and they ask, um, as your research for the book progressed, what themes seemed confirmed by what you read and learned? And what, if any, themes were significantly changed? That is a good question. Um, I mean, I might argue that as I'm going doing the research, I'm trying to avoid sort of having conclusions in mind as I'm doing the research. But there are things that, do, that, that certainly come forward. One is that, I mean, I certainly have always believed that 19th century, mid 19th century American women were, were engaged in politics and they were not merely the passive voices of their, their spouses or partners. And that certainly seems to be the case. Now, it may be that in 1840, they were less engaged, but during the war, you know, women are clearly very engaged in, in all sorts of ways. And so that's one theme that comes out. Um, I went into the project interested in just how racist were these people, these Democrats? And that's, that's in some sense impossible to assess. Um, but I suppose I was a little surprised that in the public speech and public writings, and in most of the diaries and letters of, I read, which was a lot, um, that, that they kind of, I didn't see as much raw racism as I feared. I certainly saw plenty, but um, um, 
I would say my coming away conclusion was that these Northern Democrats these were largely, especially the ones who were above the slave states, were largely kind of indifferent to slavery. They weren't as worried about slavery as I kind of would have expected. Um, but they were worried about emancipation yielding people of color, black people moving into Northern states um, um, in, in, where there was no slavery. They were worried about integration more than they were worried about slavery one way or the other. Um, that surprised me a bit. Um, but there were lots of themes embedded in this. Why you said at the beginning um, that this whole subject hasn't been very well researched or looked into? Why do you think that is? I mean, so much of the Civil War has really been mined, and it seemed like this area perhaps a lot less so than other ones. Why do you think that is? No, that's a good question. I mean, I don't want to say there's nothing, but and there, um, there's a famous book by a, a political historian by Joe, named Joe Silby, which is came out in the seventies. It was a really good book, and there's a good book by Gene Baker. Um, um, and there are articles, um, and there are also, there are in, pro in progress some dissertations right now. Um, but uh, I think part of it is that you, you know, if you look at the Civil War, the, the Democrats were the folks who opposed Abraham Lincoln. You know, they opposed emancipation, even though eventually they kind of agreed to kind of go along. Um, they also become the party of resistance to reconstruction after the war. Um, and, you know, I, part of me says it, it's an unappealing topic because they're un, these are unappealing people. Um, on the other hand, you know, the shelf is full of books about Hitler, so that may not be a particularly good answer. Um, there's lots more written about the Nazis than about the Democrats. Um, so I'm not quite sure that, um, you know, that. Is also, uh, I, I come to the profession not as a political historian. And I think to some extent, you know, the, the social historians who turn to the Civil War are not interested in politics. And this was kind of, this is for me, is late in the game. You know, I just retired before, you know, this book just came out. Um, and, and so fewer people are thinking about politics. So certain people are. Um, but I don't have a really good answer. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from uh, Corey Field. She says, wow. great talk. Thank you. Can you say more about how Democratic men welcome or constrain women's public activism? Were Democrats' attitudes different than Republicans? That's another good question. And, you know, there's the, I think that if you think of sort of, let's say, public women in this period, well-known public women, um, they're not exclusively, but they're largely, you know, abolitionist leaning and Republican leaning, you know, Susan B. Anthony and Katie Stanton and Mayanna Dickerson and so on. But that's sort of a, that's kind of a, the, the, the tip of a, a particular kind of iceberg. I don't find any examples. And of course, you know, I've, I've read lots of correspondence and so on. I find lots of examples of um, men and women arguing about politics. And some examples of them sort of sort of differing on what the man of the house should do, for instance, about the draft or whatever. I didn't see any good examples of you know, what might, one might expect, which is um, the man saying to the wife, you know, you can't do this, you can't, you know, you must follow my lead. Um, um, there's actually, you know, good examples of the, uh, the opposite, actually. But I don't see. And this gets back to Iris' question too. I don't see a lot of examples of democratic men, in some sense, trying to kind of silence the beliefs of women. Although um, you might say there's a certain amount of patronizing language in some letters, so not not, not most, but some. Um, but mostly, I find that in, that's incredibly rich terrain where these people are arguing about things. One of my favorite examples is are the standards. Um, who are from somewhere, I think they're from Iowa, but um, that is a published book, but he is, they're, they're both Democrats and he is actually pr pretty viciously racist. Um, but late in the war, he enlists and he pretty clearly enlists to avoid being conscripted. Um, but once he's in the army, he wants to get out of the army and his wife 
writes to him consistently, giving him suggestions on how to get out of the army, you know, strategies he might want to pursue. And what's really interesting is that she uses the language of kind of sort of a certain kind of deferential language, like, and she almost literally says, I know I'm only a woman, but it seems to me you might want to consider this. And she does that repeatedly when he's she's making very wise suggestions on how he might get himself out of the army. Um, so that is very kind of gendered language. Um, although they're on the same page that they would, they both would like him to get out of the army. Um, he doesn't. Um, he ends up joining the, um, the US colored troops, thinking he might get a promotion. Um, uh, we've got another question coming in. Um, does a particular archival research stand out to you as having been especially useful? A particular archive? Um, yeah. Uh, for this book, I didn't go to a ton of archives. This book, I, I, I certainly went. The, the I, I, I made heavy use of the Library Company and Historical Society. Um, I made heavy use of the Huntington Library, which is sort of my other home away from home. Um, I found great material in Kentucky at the Kentucky Historical Society. Um, I also, and this is not an archive, but a, but a collection, um, and which I didn't really quote today. Um, there is a, a wonderful body of data produced by the Provo Marshal's office in 1866, where in 1866, the Provo Marshal asks each um, district Provo Marshal to write a report on the Civil War. So basically, how did the draft go? What went wrong? What went right? And these people write long accounts of things they faced, including deserters, copperheads, newspapers. And these are handwritten accounts, but they're all microfilmed, and now they're on CD-ROM. So. Um, you know, they're at the library. They're, I'm sorry, they're, they're, um, they're National Archives, but I didn't go there, but I, I bought them. Um, so, I mean, that's a great archive, and I spent six months reading those materials, but I didn't go there. Um, but there's a huge amount, you know, at the, at the, as I say, library company, at the historical society, um, an awful lot. What year were you a fellow at the library company? <laughs> I've been a fellow more than once, and I, I wish I um, I was not a fellow for the, the my dissertation. I just I got another grant and, and went. Um, I was a fellow. I did a book on which I should mention because it's it's St. Patrick's Day. I did a book comparing Philadelphia and Liverpool, and in response to the Irish famine migration, and I got an NEH for that. So that was you know a fellow, but it was. And then um, I got a. For this book, I got a fellowship, uh, I'm pretty sure. Um, I think I've had, I think I've been a fellow for the Library Company Historical Society twice. Um, and then I was a fellow for the NEH that one time too. Um, so there's another question here. Can you talk more about the role of diaries and personal writing in your research? Um, and how does personal writing kind of illuminate social history? I mean, you mentioned before that this was some of this, the, you know, the highlight research that you had done for this is reading some of these diaries. Right. Well, that's a good question. And, and obviously the, the, the challenges, well, there are lots of challenges. The, that one of the great appeals of the Civil War is that people were more inclined, I think, I think it's probably pretty clearly the case, to both write letters and write diaries during the war than other periods of their lives. And perhaps more importantly, other people were more inclined to save them. So somebody keeps a diary during the war or writes letters from um, during the war. Um, 30 years later, family members put them in a box and put them in the attic and eventually they end up in an archive. Um, whereas it's harder to find, I, when I wrote about the Irish family, it was much harder to find diarists from the 1840s, so they, they, they certainly exist. Now, the problem, of course, is what do they represent? Um, you can, you know, you, you can't, I mean, for this book, I'm citing lots of things, um, but I'm not citing 500 diaries. I'm citing, I'm, I'm you know, using dozens. Um, and, you know, you kind of have to tease out whether this person somehow represents something, you know, particularly 
um, distinctive or something that is somewhat typical. Um, but then other cases like that, um, Anna LaRoche, uh, who so I mentioned earlier, she was very good as an observer. She would go to a, a democratic rally and she would describe you know, who was there, what was going on, and who was yelling, and so on. And so she gave me a, a sense of her own opinions and her own emotions, but she was also kind of a journalist in, her, in describing things. Um, and I guess you'd argue that could be better. To, um, but it is tricky. Um, it's tricky to, to not overclaim the significance um, you know, of, of that which survives as a personal paper. Um, which is one reason I, I made heavy use of the Provo Marshall's records. You know, they're very good at, at they're very good at telling me what people were doing in, a, in like in you know Chicago or Milwaukee, um, and even though they're not really being quoted, um, so it's a different kind of source. Um, and of course, there's tons of newspapers. Thank you very much. It was super interesting, and we thank you for your time. Uh, Professor Goldman, it's always great to catch up with a former fellow at the library company. So all the interesting stuff that you are up to. And I want to thank everyone for attending tonight's Fireside Chat. Um, our next Fireside Chat is scheduled for April 21st and is called The One That Wears the Breaches, Women's Fashion, Dress Reform, and Gender Expectations in, 19th, uh, in the 19th Century, and is from former fellow Laura Ping. Um, and, that, and that is part of Power and Pump, which is a full month of fashion themed events here at the library company. And as always, you can check out our full calendar of events, learn, learn more about the organization at librarycompany.org. And thanks again, Professor. This is super interesting. Well, thanks for having me. I hope people um, go out and buy the book. But, um, yeah, uh, the book, uh, the info to buy the book is in the chat and uh, it'll be in the notes as well that we send out. So thanks again, everyone. All right. Have a good one, everybody.